straight talk from Israel. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. You're listening to The Jay Shapiro Show. Hello again, this is Jay Shapiro. Thanks for listening. This week I'll talk primarily about two topics that I think should be of interest to the listeners. One is the International Criminal Court, and the other is the accomplishments of President Trump vis-a-vis Israel. The highly politicized International Criminal Court just declared statehood for the Palestinians. They did it without any negotiation with Israel, without any compromise, and without any recognized boundaries. They also did it without any legal authority because the Rome Statute, which established the International Criminal Court, makes no provision for this criminal court to recognize new states. The International Criminal Court is not a real court in any meaningful sense of that word. Unlike real courts, which have statutes and common law to interpret, the International Criminal Court just makes it up as it goes along. The Palestinian decision is not based on existing law, it's based on pure politics. The Palestinians, both in the West Bank and Gaza, who have refused to negotiate in good faith and have used terrorism as their primary claim to recognition, have been rewarded for their violence by this decision. The real victims of, 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 of this uh, is the state of Israel and the world, in a sense. All in all, the International Criminal Court decision on Palestine is a setback for a single standard of human rights. It's a victory for terrorism and an unwillingness to negotiate peace, and it is a strong argument against the United States and Israel joining this biased court and giving any legitimacy. The reason I want to speak about President Trump is not, is not that he's involved in the second impeachment, but rather because many of the people that I know in America, including my own family, have a dislike for Trump that's almost psychopathic. They hate him with a fury that's unprecedented in my experience, and this is in spite of all that he's done for Israel. And it's those things that he's done for Israel that I want to talk about because they speak under the horizon and people don't let let take it into consideration i'll be back after the break The return of the Jewish people to the land of Israel was prophesied in the Bible thousands of years ago and is coming true today. Shalom. Join me, Josh Wander, on Israel Unplugged. Listen in as we delve into the spiritual and physical aspects of the Jewish return to Zion. We'll discuss the biblically mandated, historic, and of course practical understandings of this incredible transition from exile to redemption. That's Israel Unplugged. Every Monday on IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. You're listening to The Jay Shapiro Show. We're back with Jay Shapiro. I want to say a few words about President Trump's foreign policy. But I came across something in a newspaper that I want to share with the listeners before I discuss uh, Trump. According to an article in a local paper, the United States Senate will ensure the impeachment trial of former U.S. President Donald Trump will not stretch into Shabbat should it continue late Friday or into Saturday. The request was filed by David Schoen, one of Trump's lead defense lawyers, who is an observant Jew and observes Shabbat. In a letter obtained by the Times, the New York Times, Schoen had requested that the trial be suspended if it is not finished before sundown on Friday when Shabbat commences, and he gave the letter uh, the specific time, 5.24 p.m., 
And he said the following, I apologize for the inconvenience, my quest that impeachment proceedings not be conducted during the Jewish Sabbath, undoubtedly because other people involved in the proceedings will be inconvenienced. Uh, the letter was sent to Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer and to Senate Minority Leader uh, Mitch McConnell and Senate President Pro Tem Patrick Leahy. The practices and prohibitions are mandatory for me, according to the letter. However, so respectfully, I have no choice but to make this request. Following your request, Schumer, who is also Jewish, promised to accommodate Schoen and ensure he will, he will be able to uphold Shabbat observance. Uh, this is not the first time, by the way, that the uh, concerns for Shabbat observance have come up at an impeachment trial. Back in 1999, during the impeachment trial of former President Bill Clinton, the Connecticut senator at that time, Joe Lieberman, was an Orthodox Jew, did not break Shabbat by getting in a car and instead walked four miles to Capitol Hill. Lieberman had also refrained from campaigning or taking part in political activity over Shabbat, with the exception of attending Senate sessions to vote if needed, but he never traveled by car or rode in elevators. Other Orthodox Jewish politicians also had to bow in Shabbat observance with their work. Jack Lew, who served as Treasury Secretary under Clinton and was White House Chief of Staff for uh, Barack Obama, also kept Shabbat during his career. On the opposite side of the political spectrum, Trump's daughter Ivanka Trump and his son-in-law, senior advisor James Jared Kushner, are both Orthodox Jews and observe Shabbat, attending synagogue and refusing to use electronics. That was something in the paper. I just wanted, it was so cute and interesting. I wanted to share it with the listeners before I began discussing Donald Trump's foreign policy, which I'll do now. And it may take more than one uh, segment of my program, but let's see. In general, what can be said that Donald Trump has succeeded in accelerating and deepening a political and social transformation began in the United States nearly 20 years ago. His revolutionary method of dealing with foreign policy issues was a political shock to the system that stood in stark contrast to the approach, approaches of his predecessors who preferred not to stray from traditional paths. In Asia, for example, the uh, Trump made an unprecedented effort to solve the problems of North Korea, an area in which Jewish policy has not seen any breakthrough since the Korean War back in 1953. Trump took an unorthodox, uh, unorthodox approach and showed a political resolve that many U.S. presidents lacked, despite never having been a politician. At the Korean, um, the, um, the, the military zone between North and South Korea, he briefly crossed the border into North Korea, making him the first sitting U.S. president to enter that country. Had it not been for Chinese pressure on North Korea to stop Trump from succeeding, the most heavily fortified border in the world could have ceased to exist during his term, but the Chinese prevented any change. Now, in December 2016, uh, it marked the first time since nine president had spoken directly to a Taiwanese president. In, in and out of mainland China considers Taiwan to be a part of their country. The Taiwanese consider themselves to be independent. And the uh, Trump spoke with the president of Taiwan. Trump's administration was the first to put great economic pressure on Beijing to contain its expansionist ambitions and was the first and only government in the West to publicly blame China for its role in the coronavirus pandemic. The uh, 
In 2017, Trump uh, revived the Asian NATO, it's called Quad, which is a strategic forum between the United States, Australia, Japan, and India to counter the increased Chinese influence in the Asia-Pacific region. In Europe, Trump brokered a landmark agreement last year between Kosovo and Serbia on the normalization of relations in which the countries agreed to restore flights between Belgrade and Pristina for the first time since the war in 1999. Trump also achieved a historic accomplishment, and this is one that really touches us in Israel. He achieved an historic accomplishment by mediating peace deals between four Arab states, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Morocco, and Sudan, and to, uh, with Israel within a matter of months. This is something unmatched by any of his predecessors. Trump proved to be the first U.S. president to keep his election promise of recognizing Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, and he was the first sitting U.S. president to visit the Western Wall. Now, Sudan is now closer than ever before to the United States. Just 25 years ago, Khartoum, the capital of Sudan, was sheltering Osama bin Laden while Bill Clinton was preoccupied with his sexual scandals, allowed the founder of Al-Qaeda, Osama bin Laden, to re relocate to Afghanistan and plot the 9-11 terrorist attack on the United States. Within the past 10 months, Trump eliminated ISIS leader Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, al-Qaeda's number two Abu Muhammad Masri, and Qasem Soleimani, the mastermind behind Iran's military and subversive operations in the Middle East. Masari, who played a prominent role in planning the bombings of the U.S. embassies in Kenya and Tanzania, was targeted in a joint operation with Israeli agents on the 22nd anniversary of the attacks, which occurred while Clinton was in power. Trump's predecessor, Barack Obama, who was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize within a year after taking office, with no achievements, by the way, to, to justify that prize, uh, left Trump with a political legacy of a defeatist nuclear deal with Iran from which Trump withdrew. Obama also left Trump with overwhelming chaos in Syria, uh, the, uh, and, and it was Trump, not Obama, who launched airstrikes targeting Damascus' chemical arsenal for the first time. So the core of Trump's foreign policy view was to avoid random wars and push for peace, while at the same time undermining forces that pose a threat to global prosperity and security. By he, what he wanted to do was constrain these other countries politically and uh, militarily and economically. Nevertheless, the left viewed Trump's foreign policy with cynicism, with skepticism and prejudice, the, despite the fact he was the first president in decades not to enter in, in any foreign wars during his tenure. Trump broke the political chain that had prevailed for decades in the U.S. In the process, he seemed to prove that his base is greater than that of the Republican Party itself. More than 70 million people, I think 75 million people, voted for him for president. He lost, but he lost with the greatest number of any loser in history. Though Trump lost the election, I guess you could say he had established something called Trumpism. It wasn't defeated. On the contrary, it took root and has become the wild card in the American political equation. And who knows? It may even spread by the, the, uh, further than the borders to the United States and become a global movement against the deep, what's called the deep state. Uh, whatever that may be and wherever that may be, there's a, there is a, a, a system that exists that keeps repeating itself. I guess that's what they call the deep state. But at any rate, Trump took on the deep state, 
And even though today he's on trial for impeachment, which may or may not be legitimate, that's a story unto itself, we have to give credit where credit is due. And Trump has made a revolutionary foreign policy. I'll be back after the break. everyone, this is Andrea Simento from Jerusalem inviting you to drop everything and join me on my show, Pull Up a Chair. We'll visit this week's quirky stories, meet fabulous guests, and discover my Israel. Together we'll laugh, shout, and explain the topics that make us say, hey, we've got to talk about that. So get comfortable and pull up a chair with me, Andrea Simento, every Thursday on Israel News Talk Radio. You're listening to The Jay Shapiro Show. You're back with Jay Shapiro. The International Criminal Court has decided that it will allow the state of Palestine to sue the state of Israel. Now, the highly politicized International Criminal Court essentially has declared statehood for the Palestinians. They did it without any negotiation with Israel, without any compromise, and without any recognized boundaries. They also did it without any legal authority because the Rome Statute, which established the International Criminal Court makes no provision for this criminal court to recognize new states. The International Criminal Court is not a real court in any meaningful sense of that word. Unlike real courts, which have statutes and common law to interpret, the International Criminal Court just makes it up. Uh, In the case that was just brought up about uh, allowing Palestine to sue Israel, One dissenting judge said that the decision is based on politics. It's not based on any existing law. So I want to say a few words about the background to this. Uh, The the fathers of the vision of creating an independent international criminal court was after the the atrocities committed against the Jewish people during the Holocaust. And now it turns out the Jewish people are the target of that court. As one of the leading countries actively involved from the start to the negotiation and drafting of the founding document, the statute of the International Criminal Court, which I'll call the ICC, It's all the more ironic that Israel now finds itself being accused by the court based on Palestinian political manipulation. What was intended to be an independent body devoted to preventing impunity enjoyed uh, enjoyed by the most serious and atrocious war criminals, the idea was to bring them to justice. And now it's being politically manipulated against Israel, which has consistently advocated the establishment of such a body. The irony is all the more evident given the legal legal acrobatics by the politically oriented prosecutor of the court and a majority of the judges, what's called the pretrial chamber. They insist on attributing elements of statehood and sovereignty to a Palestinian state that does not exist, nor does any such entity have any uh, sovereign territory, and even according to the statute of the ICC, cannot be subject to the court's jurisdiction. The Palestinians have absolutely no standing in the ICC. It's not surprising, given the prevailing international atmosphere of incitement and hostility toward Israel. 
throughout the entire United Nations system. However, what's worse is that the one international institution that was intended by its founders to be an independent, permanent international criminal court with jurisdiction over the most serious crimes of concern to the international community as a whole, it has now allowed itself to be politically manipulated and abused. It was supposed to be a jury, a court, devoid of political pressure and influence, and now it has allowed itself to become one of the Israel-bashing body at the disposal of those elements in international community seeking to undermine Israel legitimacy. In so doing, the court has irreparably pre prejudiced any credibility that it might have had. So what has happened is a decision by the court's pre-child chamber to accept the contention of the prosecutor based purely on non-binding political resolutions of the UN General Assembly that the court can exercise jurisdiction over disputed territory that is in the midst of an internationally recognized dispute settlement. This defies all legal uh, logic. It's more illogical given the fact that the state of Israel is not party to the Rome Statute. That's a long story in itself. The ICC statute is open to sovereign states only, and there is no Palestinian sovereign state, and since there exists no territory over which the court could even extend its jurisdiction, the, the whole thing makes no sense. In light of the fact that the territory subject of uh, the subject of the Palestinian re referrals to the court, that is the West Bank and Gaza, are under an agreed and internationally accepted dispute settlement and a negotiation process. So what the ICC did has absolutely no legal grounds by any legal object. object. So. What they're doing, and this is very sad, they made a decision that not only harms the integrity and credibility of the international court, and it also has the potential to undermine and derail the Middle East peace negotiating process, since the court, at the behest of its prosecutor, is attempting to prejudge the outcome of that process, contrary to all historic and legal logic. In other words, to sum up, this court, which has no standing, has essentially given the Palestinian people, which or the Palestinian state, which does not exist, has given its standing in this court in order to sue Israel. The whole thing makes no sense from the very beginning. What it is is simply a hijacking and manipulation of this court, which is the antithesis of the vision of its founding fathers. They originally set up the court because they wanted to make a genuinely objective court that would judge states that misbehaved. Instead, it is doing pretty much the opposite. First of all, it's recognizing Palestine as a state, which it is not, doesn't exist as a state, and of all the terrible things being done by various nations in the world, it's decided to allow Israel to be sued. The whole thing makes no sense. The International Criminal Court is not a real court in any meaningful sense of that word. Unlike real courts, which have statutes and common law to interpret, the International Criminal Court just makes it up. One of the judges who opposed, one judge opposed bringing Israel to the court, uh, pointed out that the Palestinian decision is not based on existing law. It is based on pure politics. And the politics of the majority decision is based in turn on applying a double standard to Israel. 
And the, the United Nations, the Inter International Court of Justice, and other international bodies apply different standards to Israel than they do to any other group, any other country. The, uh, there, are other, there are numerous other groups like the Kurds and the Tibetans, among others, who claim some degree of independence that neither the International Criminal Court nor other international courts have ever given them recognition. But the Palestinians, who have refused to negotiate in good faith and have used terrorism as their primary claim to recognition, have been rewarded for their violence by, violence by this decision of the court. In Israel, which has offered the Palestinian statehood in exchange for peace on several occasions, has been punished for its willingness to negotiate and its determination to protect its citizens from Palestinian terrorism. There are a lot of war crimes going on around the world, and the International Criminal Court deliberately ignores them. So this decision to prosecute Israel is perverse. The... Uh, it's really terrible. Israel has the best record on human human rights than any other country in the world. All in all, what's happened is the International Court, Criminal Court made, made a decision on Palestine, and it really is a setback for any standard of human rights. It is essentially a victory for terrorism, and an unwillingness to negotiate peace. That's what the Palestinians have been doing. They 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 support terrorism. They don't they don't want to negotiate peace. And now they're being awarded by recognition by the International Criminal Court. So uh, this is a fact, and it, it's a fr it's really sad. More than seventy years after the Second World War. We, we've had a case where the a so-called international criminal court is taking Israel, if you will, punishing, or they're actually not punishing, they said they're going to allow the Palestinians to sue Israel. The whole thing is based on falsehoods. It's getting big headlines now, but I think the truth has to be told. I'm not an expert on the, uh, in, uh, the international criminal court, but I just wanted to pass along this information to the listeners. Something bad is going on on an international level, and Israel's the victim. I'll be back after the break. Are you interested in transforming your life, drawing closer to the Creator, and uncovering the deeper meanings and hidden treasures in the Hebrew Bible? Then join me, Rav Yitzhak Michelson, and me, William Hall, on the Science of Kabbalah, where we are seeking to narrow the gap between what we understand of our physical and spiritual worlds. So make sure to tune in every Tuesday at 5 p.m. Israel Time, 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, here on Israel News Talk Radio. You're listening to The Jay Shapiro Show. You're back with Jay Shapiro. I want to say something about the fact that the new Biden administration, which is less than three weeks old, is already threatening to undermine a lot of things that were done by Trump, in particular in the Middle East. The new uh, Biden administration has indicated it would like to return to the catastrophic nuclear Iran deal, and evidently perceiving an American wishing to appease it, and the Iranian mullahs announced on January 4th they had decided to resume resume enriching uranium, so close to the purity used for nuclear weapons. Now, also, and this is important particularly to Israel, the Biden administration also seems eager to restore USA to the Palestinian Authority 
and reconnect with its leaders without talking to them about their support for terrorism and instead treat treating them again as partners for peace, no matter how much evidence there is to the contrary, and attempting to move toward what the good, the so-called two-state solution, which is not a solution to anything. So I'd like to say a few words to sum up what was good for Israel in particular and for the West in general by Trump. This is something a new administration is attempting to hide. The Abraham Accords that were signed in September at the White House by Israel, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, and the United States set in motion a new peace process that many observers would have considered unimaginable just a few years ago. This new peace process has continued well beyond, beyond the 2020 U.S. elections, and they are at the heart of a broader revolution as changing the Middle East and the Arab world. It is a revolution that is one of the major achievements of the Trump presidency. Uh, oh, by the way, also Sudan has signed on again. Now, it, it appears that the new administration in Washington is eager to drag everything that bears Trump's name through the mud. So it's a good idea to analyze what happened and, by, and what Trump did. So in the few minutes that we have, from, I want to say a few things about what President Trump did from the moment he took office. He uh, destroyed the Islamic State, and uh, by December 2017, the group that controlled the Islamic State had, had only 5% of its territory left. By March, he moved in cash to in, in incapacitate the regime of Iran by um, announcing the United States was abandoning the nuclear deal, and he implemented sanctions aimed at curtailing Iran's adventurism. Trump also distanced himself from the two-state solution, and um, he improved U.S. ties with much of the Muslim Arab world. He made a crucial trip to Riyadh in 2017, and there in Riyadh, he told the 54 leaders from Sunni Muslim countries gathered there that the United States would be on their side in facing Iranian threats, and the U.S. was ready to help them overcome instability on the strict condition that they lead a fight against terrorism and radical Islam. Trump, clearly aware that discreet meetings had been held between Israel leaders and leaders of several countries tried to follow up successfully on those things. Trump saw that the intransigence of the Palestinian leadership, which the leaders of the Arab world had long supported, was now seen by them as something not good. Trump did not say a single word about the, about the Palestinian Authority when he visited Riyadh, the capital of Saudi Arabia. He traveled on the first flight from Riyadh to Israel. He visited the Western Wall. Uh, he the first American president of the United States to visit the Western Wall. And he affirmed unwavering support for Israel. He went to Ramallah, where he told the Palestinian president that he doesn't want him to see him support terrorism anymore. Uh, in November of 2017, Trump asked a team led by his son-in-law, Kushner, to draw up a peace plan that respected Israel's security and took into account of what was important for Israel. During the following months, he asked the Palestinian Authority to stop its terrorist activities. When the Palestinian Authority cut off the financing financing, financing granted to it by the United States and ceased to treat its leaders as legitimate people. On December 6, 2017, and this is really important, Trump officially announced that he recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and he relocated the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem. It was a way of saying that Israel's presence in Jerusalem was fully legitimate and no one would be permitted to push Israel around. The U.S. Embassy was inaugurated less than a year later in May of 2018. 
In September of 2018, Trump asked the U.S. Department of State to issue a statement saying that from now on, the U.S. will recognize as refugees only the Arabs who had personally left Israel in 1948-1949 and added, and added that the U.S. would no longer fund the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine, UNRWA an organization that claims there are more than 5 million Palestinian refugees, most of them, almost all of whom have never set foot in Palestine, all their descendants. Trump said that the idea of return to Israel, millions of people who were not actually refugees, was no longer a negotiating table. Trump's peace plan, at least in its economic component, was presented to in Bahrain, in 2019, representatives from 39 countries, including Egypt, Jordan, Morocco, and the Gulf countries were present, as well as businessmen from all over the Arab world. The plan presented at the White House in 2020, January, talks about a Palestinian state, but stipulates that Israel's security would be guaranteed. If a Palestinian state were to come into being, it would have borders controlled by Israel and no border with an Arab state. This plan actually offered the prospect of sovereignty within this security framework to the Palestinian Arabs. The proposal allows Israel to retain a necessary control of the Jordan Valley and pledges that Israel will be able to take over uh, sovereignty over 30% of Judea and Samaria. So, uh, Above all, the plan says that the Palestinian state can only come into being if the leaders and the Palestinians fully renounce and end terrorism. Palestinian leaders immediately refused the offer. A few days later, at the insistence of the Palestinian Authority, the Arab League also refused the plan. The, the Abraham Accords followed, and they were the were, they brought up the prospects of peace mentioned by President Trump, and uh, they had not been condemned by the Arab League. As anticipated by Trump in May of 2017, the Abraham Accords have an economic and a strategic dimension. They not only offer economic opportunities to all the signatories, but also reinforce their military strength. Actually, the plan includes the Palestinian Arabs, but uh, they didn't sign the agreement. So the Abraham Accords have led more broadly to a cultural and religious opening of the Emirates and Bahrain to Judaism. The, um, they, they have a Hebrew language um, uh, in, uh, in Dubai. The Hebrew language is, is becoming more common, and they have a museum that displays old maps of Jerusalem and other things like that. There was a giant Hanukkah candelabra. Uh, of course, there's a, a Chabad there. Uh, and it was set up in front of Dubai's uh, world's to uh, tallest skyscraper to celebrate Hanukkah. Mohammed bin Zayed, the crown prince of Abu Dhabi, has been working for years to spread a non-political vision of Islam and it's entrusted the management of his country religious issues to a uh, scholar, a Sufi scholar. The Trump administration made an agreement with Sudan, and uh, also there, it's very good for Sudan for other for a lot of reasons. The uh, the uh, the kingdom there in Morocco already has low key ties with Israel. Around a million Jews of Moroccan origin are, below, are live in Israel, and uh, the Jews of Morocco are considered by the kingdom uh, as citizens. Saudi Arabia has not yet reached a normalization agreement with Israel, but it seems to be on the way. The, uh, the, the field of security can be very important to the Saudi Arabians because of their fear of Iran. So to, and it could use Israeli technologies, and that would be useful for the economic transportation uh, for Saudi Arabia. So what's happened is that under Trump, and I brought these things up, there are several more things. As far as Israel and the Middle East is concerned, 
Trump has done something that hasn't been done previously by anybody. And the new administration may try to do away with some of those things, which would be a terrible tragedy, not only for the Middle East and not only for Israel, but for the world. Trump did wonderful things for the Middle East, and they don't want to give him credit for it. And that is too bad. Very sad. Uh, until next time, Jay Shapiro signing off. If you love Israel News Talk Radio, then you'll love our Facebook page. We keep you up to date on what's happening in Israel, plus little surprise treasures that we don't share on the radio. Go now to follow us on Facebook. Just look for the Israel News Talk Radio Facebook page. And don't forget to subscribe and follow us by clicking on the like button. We post great stuff there that you'll want to share. Israel News Talk Radio on Facebook and Israel News Radio on Twitter. If you're hearing this message, everyone else can too. Advertise with Israel News Talk Radio and get your message out to people. We'll build a personalized package for you. Contact advertising at IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. Straight talk from Israel. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. Hey, this is Jake in Anchorage, Alaska, and I love listening to all the super interesting interviews and up-to-date information on what's happening in Israel. Hello, this is Anna King, originally from London, now living in Israel. And what can I say? Israel News Talk Radio is my cup of tea. My name is Bhaskar. I'm from India, and I love listening because you get to know the truth and wonderful voices from this lovely country. Mom! Okay, wait a minute. Hi, this is Chava Dax, and I'm calling for the rolling hills of Malaya Dumim, just north of Jerusalem. I always listen to Israel News Talk Radio to get all the latest news and commentary and to keep me up to date every day. This is Sarah Dax from Malaya Dumim, and I'm 12. I wish Israel News Talk Radio was boring so my mom wouldn't listen to it all the time. Mom! You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. News, opinion, and more. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio.